Um, I actually sent it, I sent it out a few times. I got some good feedback. Right. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming out on this rainy night. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm Steph Schmidt. I'm the manager here at Water Street Bookstore. Um, we're so pleased to have Diane LeBeck with us tonight celebrating her new novel, Breaking Wild. Um, she has previously published three young adult novels, all the high acclaim. She's the, a professor of English and a faculty member of the MFA program in fiction and nonfiction at Southern New Hampshire University. Um, we love SNHU here. We're so happy to have all of you guys who are connected to the school in our store tonight. Um, it's a fantastic writing program. It's nurtured a lot of wonderful writers, so keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Breaking Wild is such a great book. Um, it's that rare breed that balances beautiful prose with edge of your seat action. There are moments in here when I just couldn't stand not knowing what was going to happen, but I also didn't want to read quickly or skip ahead because the writing is so good. Um, thank you all again for coming out, and uh, please join me in welcoming Diane Lebeck. So, thank you, Steph. <clears throat> Thanks for reading the book and saying such nice things about it. And I'm really Thankful to be here. And I just see that in all the rain and the travel, I kind of lost my place. So please bear with me. So I thought I would start by sharing a passage with you all from Marjorie Kinnon Rawlings, who's one of my favorites. She won the Pulitzer for writing The Yearling. But before that, I know you. But before that, it's nice to see such friendly faces out there. Um, it's good to have friends when you're a writer going on tours, <laughs> making events. So before she wrote The Yearling, though, back in the 1930s, she was in a failing marriage. She was a failing writer. And she bought some property in rural Florida. And she wrote a nonfiction book based on her experiences there with the community and with the land that she got to know buying the citrus grove in this rural area. And that book's called Cross Creek. And it's one of my very favorite, favorite books. And I discovered that book shortly after leaving everything I knew and moving to an area that I had never, ever seen into a home I had never, ever seen, a town I'd never visited. I ended up um, driving with two young children who were basically, well, one was still in diapers, one was toddling around. And they all were sick. We're driving a big moving truck. My husband was horribly sick. And they ended up all having a flu. Unfortunately, I didn't get it. But we drove across country, and we moved into this little ranching town in northwestern Colorado. And the first night was spent at the hospital getting everybody, trying to get them well. And the house had been closed up for about a year. It was in very dire, sh 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 dire straits. I remember looking in the stove in the oven and mice had literally dehydrated onto cords and wires and we had no money for a new stove. So it meant I had to take the screwdriver, take the whole stove apart and peel off all the critters that had found their way in there. So it's really, really an interesting experience. We were just dirt poor, but we were determined to make a life in this area. And I fell in love with it. I totally fell in love with it. And about the same time I discovered this book, Cross Creek. And two, two of the passages that really spoke with me a couple of them, and that's how I want to open up is, one is, we cannot live without the earth or apart from it, and something is shriveled in a man's heart when he turns away from it and concerns himself only with the affairs of men. So this was an area of great land. You're not going to fall in love with the, the town and the town buildings, believe me. But around it was this amazing landscape. It was just truly, truly Good remarkable. Job. Good to see Here's a couple another passage, and after long years of spiritual loneliness, nostalgia. Here is that mystic loveliness of childhood again. Here is home, an old thread, long tangled, comes straight again. So when I was growing up, I was a girl who was always building forts in the woods. I was in the creek. I cut my hair short and told everyone to call me David. I bought my clothes in the boys' department. And my mother had a fit, and she sent me to charm school, and she sewed me clothes, and it was a disaster. Um, and fortunately, my dad's family was from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and I could spend a lot of time up there in the fish house, and my uncles would leave me the four-wheelers and the three-wheelers and the boats, and I just could not get enough of being outdoors. But I had this wonderfully polished Southern Belle of a mother who literally won all the beauty pageants when she was young. I drove her crazy. I still do, but I adore her. And I don't know if any of you all got to hear the NPR interview. Did anyone get to hear that? With David Green. So, <laughs> so I'm like on this tour, and my 
<laughs> my mom sends me an email and she's like, I really loved your book. And I'm like, well, that's really sweet. And she says, but I really want to talk to you at some point when you get home from the tour. And, and so I just called her. I said, okay, mom, just, just give it to me. She said, well, I don't want to upset you. But honey, you know, you, you do these things and you go outdoors and you bow hunt and you cover yourself with this stuff. And, and you know, you love the outdoors, but, but you are also a lady now. And, and ladies do not say the word piss. <laughs> because in the interview, um, you know, I was telling him I was covered in elk piss. And my mother said, you notice how he corrected you because he called it elk urine. <laughs> so she's a really sweet, sweetheart of a lady. Um, but yeah, you know, I, just, I loved this Western landscape. And I loved being able to be who I was without those constraints of the Southern culture on me that I'd been raised in. I could just go out there. I worked with archaeologists. I learned how to bow hunt. I, I'd done some shooting with rifles. I'd been a marksman when I was younger. But I wanted something more. I wanted to be closer to the animals, closer to the wilderness. Um, I would go out and set my stands by myself, do all of these things. And I just felt the dirt in my, in my veins, you know. It was just felt like it was part of me, like almost like I was from there. Uh, especially with the archaeological digs. And when you're up there camping in the dirt for two weeks at a time or three or four weeks at a time, I'd bring my boys up there with me. I knew I'd sit up there in these sites, and they were amazing, and I thought, I want to write a novel that takes place here. And that's when it first started, but that was years and years ago. You know, I was a fledgling human being, being at that point, not to mention a fledgling writer. And so, again, that, again that's why I identified with Marjorie Kennan Rawlings. But this other area, this other thing that was so cool about this archaeological area that where we were excavating was that these were the Fremonts, and they were a vanishing civilization that had, had started out in Utah when they flourished and had this big community. And then they start moving over into western Colorado, and there's four or five cliff-dwelling sites, very <coughs> isolated um, home sites, home dwellings. And the one that we excavated over a course of four years was literally where they could have been literally pit-roasting something, having their entire you know, family life going on, and the cliff literally must have fallen on top of them, though we did not, we did call a shaman, and we did not find any human remains, so they got out. But everything else was there, their pottery shards, you know, their basket bundlery, all of that was there. And at night, we'd hear these, these, these sounds, we'd say, well, it's the, it's the Fremonts, you know, and, and we'd get the students scared or whatever, but there was a mystery there, and that, so even being able to tap into that mystery and that symbolism and that sacred spirituality, I thought would be just incredible. And the other thing that happened was as I was taking up bow hunting, there's an adrenaline you get and you, you want to get out every chance you have. So I, would, I had a pickup truck and I kept everything in the back of the truck so I could take off and go on a bow hunt at any time. And we got off work early one day and I drove, it was about an hour and a half in greater wilderness um, to an area called Cyclone Pass. And I am doused in elk piss and camouflage paint and clothes that have no human scent on them. I've washed my hair of all this stuff to get rid of human perfume and all of that. And I have my bugle, I have my backpack and my bow. I go in there and I start bugling back and forth with, the, forth with this elk. And he was amazing. I mean, you can tell from the sound, this guy was big. And I didn't have a large window of time to hunt because you can't take a shot after dusk. So we're calling back and forth. He's drawing me deeper and deeper into the wilderness. I'm really intense to get this shot before time is gone. But what happens at night, right? As with every night, it gets dark. And dusk had come and gone, and there was not going to be a shot. So OK, you know, I'll get my backpack. The boys are at their dad's tonight. I was divorced at this time. And I went to get my headlamp, and it was burned out. And it started to drizzle. And when it drizzles, there's no moonlight, there's no starlight. It's just really, really dark. <laughs> it was really dark. And the deadfall in this area where I was was literally, you know, you sit on it, swing your legs over, then there's another one, swing your legs over. There had been elk bedding around the area where I was as well. These animals are big. The year before, I'd been charged by an enormous elk, literally to the point where I could feel his breath on my face. So I knew I was in deep trouble. I mean, I began. I, I was terrified. And eventually, after about, I think it was about five or six hours, I found my way back to a trail that, that was there. There wasn't, were no trails where I was hunting, but it was a trail that led me back to my truck. And I got back in time to get a quick shower and get into work by 8 o'clock the next morning. But driving home for that hour and a half stretch, I thought, here's my story. A you know, female bow hunter goes out in the wilderness and gets lost. But she's alone hunting, which you're not supposed to do, but I did. She's alone hunting. And 
And I thought, well, what does that mean? That's not enough of a story. You know, I'm not a formulaic kind of genre writer. What's her story? What does that mean metaphorically? And so then I started thinking, she's lost in her life. And at that point in my life, I knew as much as I was having this incredible love affair with that part of the country, I was going to have to leave it because I had three sons at the time with um, a father who did not have a job, and, and I felt responsible for these children. And cobbling the life together I was doing was not going to support these young, intelligent boys who were going to be college bound. So I began applying for college jobs. I'd gotten an MFA, and, and uh, it was looking pretty promising, one of them particularly here in New Hampshire. And that, that was tough. On one hand, it was wonderful, and I wanted to embrace this opportunity to support my family. And on the other hand, I was grieving. I mean, the closing when I sold my house, I just, they still say the papers still are tear stained. I mean, I literally cried all the way to the other side of the Kansas. And when I got to that border, I said, okay, enough. Seriously, you're strong. Get on with it, woman. You know, like, do this. You have kids. So, and it's worked out beautifully. I love New Hampshire now. You know, I feel like I have two homes in some ways. And New Hampshire's been very good to me. But I knew then we have a story of a woman lost in her life. But I still didn't know what her story was because I wasn't going to write this as an autobiographical novel. Um, and so I really just set it aside. I wrote you know, another young, why adult, young adult novel. I've got three young adult novels out. I took care of the kids. Um, you know, SNHU kept me very, very busy, <laughs> as it will do. Um, you know, Bob and I worked together on the MFA program. So there were a lot of things taking up my time, and I wrote a lot of short pieces. And I also fell in love with a logger and a forester here and he ended up getting brain cancer. And so that took quite a lot of my life, right? And then when he died, there was a lot of estate to clean up. There was selling his logging business, chasing lost timber in the woods, being his agent in court over landowners who now wanted more money. And I mean, it just went on and on and on. And you know, there's a point where your brain, any creativity in your brain, it's just not there. So I was really, I thought, you know, maybe I'm just here to support other writers. And, I'm not meant to do this, because I just didn't see how it was going to be possible. Um, but as I did start to emerge from the other side of that grief, uh, through a lot of good friendships here and people helping me, I started to really think about things about my husband who had passed away. He had dealt with a lot of demons in a lot of dark places, and he'd really struggled to overcome that toward the end of his life um, and make peace with that. And so I thought, what about my missing female woman in the wilds, in the wilderness? And I thought about hunting in general. When you're hunting and you're the hunter, you are now the predator, right? And so then I thought, what is her prey? And to me, metaphorically, what was so beautiful about this was her prey, as I watched my husband dealing with this, was her prey was these dark spaces in her life that she needed to overcome. And so I didn't want this just to be this typical psychological, you know, this typical thriller. I wanted it to be a psychological story and an emotional story of a woman's emotional journey as well. Um, so I wrote it in two points of view, one being the missing female hunter, which is told in third person, which allows me to really spend more time trying to understand my late husband better and get into his mind set. But then I also wanted to write it from the point of view of a female ranger who moved out there and she's a single mom because I could identify with her character for myself, um, more of a cause and effect, want to take care of problems, want to fix it, you know, commit it. And, you know, I was just this real worker. I'm going to get out there. I'll do it. There's no problem too big to solve. And so Prue doesn't give up. So you have a female hunter who goes missing in the wilderness, and you have a female ranger who sets out to find her. But as some of you have already heard me say, it's really about the wild spaces in each of these women, because as Steph's read too, the, the ranger also has a large space within her, as I also felt I had. She just doesn't show it, you know. And it gives both of them then a chance for these wild spaces, for them to explore those, and then at the climax of the book is when those wild spaces collide. Um, so I'm sharing that with you because some people say, oh, I read the book, I couldn't put it down, I read it in one night, and I'm going, but did you read the other story? You know, there's more than just the action of what takes place. So Hopefully with that backstory here, this, the book will mean more to you. And then I'm going to read you a passage so you can get the feel for the language. And uh, maybe you'll identify with that as well. The, to set it up, I don't want to, I'll probably read a little bit, paraphrase, and read because I don't want it to drag on too long and lose your interest. But Amy Ray has been lost in the wilderness. She's the female bow hunter. And she's injured, and she's very malnourished. And she's really at the end of her life at this point. And she knows that if she doesn't make one last attempt, she will, she, will, she will die. And even if her remains are found, 
they will be not found in a way where her, ch her children will not know that she was trying to get back to them. So she wants to be found at least making that attempt to get back to her children. And so she set off and she's camped one night and she covered herself with boughs that she cut to keep herself warm. But when she woke up that next morning, there were lion tracks right near her. She starts to get on her way again. And so I'll take off from that, part, that point. And so she moved on and everywhere she listened to the wind, to branches, to the silence as it pounded in her ears. But within a short distance, the ground began to descend more sharply and the wind speed had picked up to maybe 25 to 30 miles per hour. She planted her crutch downhill, and as she began to shift her weight, the crutch slipped out from beneath her. She fell onto her left side, landing on both rock and snow, and slid a good 70 feet or more until she had sunk into a drift at the bottom of the decline. All around her was snow, the drift having been more than 10 feet deep. And because it lay at the base of this western facing slope where it had received the full effect of the sun, the drift had softened to the consistency of mashed potatoes. She tried to kick step into the sides of snow around her, but each time her foot sank deeper and her body became more spent from the effort. She had been foolish to think she could find her way out of this vast place. Her calorie intake had not been enough for her to maintain her strength. Her body was malnourished, she was crippled at best, and now she was cold and stranded with no wood within reach for her to build a fire. Even if she could make it out of this drift, there would be other sink spots, more soft snow, and more ground to cover than she had the strength for, given her lack of food. She felt emptied out of anything good and hopeful. She fell back against the snow, sank to the ground. Oh God, what have I done? And though it had not been the first time, she cried until there were no tears left in her. Her stomach felt small and tight like a baby's fist. She took out the remaining juniper berries from her pack, but when she bit into their bitterness, this time her body heaved. She had only one pound or a little less of meat left, and it was frozen, and there was no way to heat it. She removed one of the four ounce cuts, held it in her gloved hand until the outer layer of frost had melted from the small portion and then sucked on the meat and chewed on it like an animal from the wild. So this was it. This would be how it all would end. And she wondered if her remains would ever be found. She tried to recall the precise core temperature at which a human body would die from the cold and thought it to be somewhere around 77 degrees. She thought of her swims in Echo Lake and Evergreen Lake where the water had been well below that temperature, sometimes only 50 degrees in June. And she wondered about that. Why had she been able to swim in those lakes? But when she swam, she had kept her arms and legs moving. She had continued to generate heat. She would have to keep moving now. But she was so weary. Perhaps if she could rest for a while, she might have the strength to find a way out of here. Melt water trickled down her neck. Her hands and feet ached and tingled with cold. She curled up into a fetal position. Still holding on to the piece of meat, she tucked her hands beneath her head. She thought of the cave and how warm its walls had felt. She thought of the fire she had built there. Perhaps she should remove her fleece jacket and tie it over her head. Though she had kept her ears warm with a strip of fleece, she knew she was losing at least 50% of her body heat from her exposed head. But she was so tired and even her thoughts felt fatiguing. The muscles in her neck and shoulders contracted and her body shivered, and she closed her eyes, if only for a few minutes, and she dreamed of coyotes, of young pups playing and wrestling in the snow. And she heard the adult coyote bark from somewhere far off in the trees. The adult barked again, but it did not sound like a coyote. Perhaps it was a wolf, and these pups weren't coyotes at all, but baby wolves. She opened her eyes. She heard the bark again. But her mind felt foggy and she was so cold, the air like ice against the layers of her damp clothing and skin. And she wondered if she was experiencing hypothermia, if she had imagined the sounds. She pushed herself to a sitting position, her hands and feet both numb, but her body was still shivering, which she knew was a good sign. She was still getting enough oxygen to the brain. Though her mind felt dull, she knew she wasn't hallucinating. She had indeed heard the barking of an animal. She wouldn't have heard coyotes. It was the middle of the day. Coyotes did not come out until dusk. There were no wolves in the area, none that she knew of. 
I'm here, she said. But her voice was weak, and a thick wall of snow surrounded her, and perhaps it was a wild dog that she had heard. But she had not seen any wild dogs in the area. She had not heard any wild dogs in all of her nights in the cave. Her legs were stiff and her muscles tight, but she forced herself to a standing position. She removed her shovel from the straps on her pack, the small shovel she had made from the elk's shoulder blade, and she began to dig. And as she dug away the snow, the blood moved back into her fingers and into her toes and into her feet. She dug faster, surprised at the adrenaline in her body. I'm here, she cried out again, her voice raspy and weak. She was making progress and her body was warming and she was certain she had heard a dog and if she had heard a dog, there was someone out there. She continued to work, packing the snow down with the shovel in her right foot as she dug a path through the drift as she created a stretch of compacted snow at almost a 40 degree angle. Using both the crutch and the shovel as poles, she was able to plant them into the incline and pull herself forward, then step, replant the poles and pull herself forward again until she was out of the drift and standing on frozen rock, her body drenched in perspiration and hope. She moved in an eastward direction from where she had heard the barking sounds, returning along the same path that she had trekked earlier that day. Here I'll paraphrase. She moves past the area where she had camped, she moves on, and she comes across a dead coyote carcass covered with boughs. And that's when she realizes that this is a lion's cache and that this is a fresh kill. And the lion during the night had mistaken her for another lion's cache. Cougars do not have good eyesight, they just have good scent. So she's able to take some of the meat from the, from the coyote, put that onto her pack to sustain her a little bit longer. She knows the kill is fresh. She secured her pack onto her back and moved away from the cache site. The whole affair had taken no more than five minutes. Her heart thumped wildly. Though she remained careful with her steps, she moved quickly, very glad for the rush of energy. As the rest of the daylight was extinguished, the moon rose higher. The sky had remained clear and her eyes had adjusted to the new light. She felt amazed at the clarity of her path, the speed with which she was able to move. With the pound of elk meat she had left and the meat from the coyote carcass, she could survive a couple more weeks, maybe more. And there was the hope that someone had found the cave where she had been staying. Perhaps the person was still somewhere close by. The barking sound she had heard had come from that same direction. And if someone had found the cave, the person might be able to determine that all this time Amy Ray had been alive. She gave thanks for the moon and the clear sky. She thought of Christmas and Julia and Trevor and Farrell as if all of it were in her reach. She thought of her childhood and the crush her father would set up in their front yard, the ceramic figures arranged around bales of hay. And for a moment, she imagined her father finding her. She imagined him calling to her and asking her to come home. Another hour passed and then another. She would walk through the entire night if she had to. She had food to eat. She still had water in her reservoir on her pack, and there was plenty of snow to melt to replenish her supply. Again, she thought of the barking dog and the coyote. Once more, she wondered if she had been wrong. She fought back the weariness creeping into her bones. She continued to call out. The cold air slapped her awake and squeezed the tears from her eyes. And then she recognized the bluffs ahead, the rocky ridge, and on the other side of this cliff was the cave and she couldn't believe she had come so far. Hello, hello. Every muscle in her body quivered with fatigue. She could not make it much farther, but the rest of her course would be around this butte and downhill toward the ledge that led into the cave. And then, in the moonlight, in that glance of blue light over the white snow, she saw the tracks, the paw prints of a large dog and beside those footprints made from the treads of hiking boots. Hello, I'm here, come back. And as she called out, she followed the tracks that had crossed in front of her path that looked no different than hers and Saddles might have years before, or hers and Moab's the Alsatian and Husky mix that she and Farrell had adopted. The tracks led around the butte, traveled within 200 feet of the cave, and then abruptly led away from the shelter moved in a southwestern direction from the ledge and disappeared into a copse of pinion and juniper and service berry. No, Amy Ray fell to her knees. 
She stared up toward the entrance of the cave, the opening barely noticeable with the rocks and boughs she had used for protection from the wind and cold. Her tracks from the previous day no longer visible, the wind and the snowfall from the early morning hours having removed every trace of her. Moonlight shone upon the cave. There it was. There it had been all along a silent precipice, as if the heavens had led her to this point to see what might have been, to see every shadow that had become her life. This was her hell, her perfect understanding of how close she had come, of how everything had always existed within her reach. How many times had she bargained and resolved herself to come clean, and yet always there was something larger in her, an absence so powerful, a room so big and vacant. She would take to the stage in that room. She would seduce the men. She would fill the big vacant space by acting the part of someone clever or passionate, bold or interesting. And each man she would conquer, each role she would play out, would become her new narrative. And then she would reinvent herself all over again never really knowing who she had ever been until the only thing staring back at her was the person she had become. And now the stage had changed and there were no more supporting cast members. This was it. This was all it had ever been. And her heart cried out in an agonizing wail of pure animal lament, come back. But she didn't know whether she was crying out to the dog that had led her once more to the cave or to the phantom person whose track she had seen, or to herself, or to God. Come back, she cried again, her knees sinking deeper into the snow-covered ledge. And then I will just open it up in case you have a few questions. If not, that's okay too. Yes. Uh, you know, I hate to give things away. I read the book, but uh, I'm going to try to question uh, without saying too much, but I guess it'll be obvious. Um, this is good, though. You read the book and you're here. Do you know how yes, good that is for an author to have someone read the book and show up at the event? Again, like you said, people have already commented. You can't put it down. And, you know, you've got to finish it. You have to find out. Um, my thinking was, do you have any um, knowledge of someone being able to survive the way she did for the length of time? Are there any real stories of that? I mean, you, you already explained that you have done a lot of this, I know, too. Yeah, you know, I really researched the book a great deal, and every footstep, literally every step that both characters took in the book, I have taken. Yeah. So I've backpacked into the area, I've rock climbed down the walls, I've done every course. I wanted it to feel that realistic. A number of people said this reads like nonfiction. Um, and as far as the survival, it's all, you know, I researched it with a number of doctors, with a number of wildlife biologists. So I went through every single thing to make sure I was accurate. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, all of that does feel believable. Yeah, I mean, it's not believable. I just was yeah. really wondering yeah. that. She was a strong, you know, and I, a lot of people weren't sure how they feel about Amy Ray in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that's come out, I don't think I'm giving too much away because it's come out in a lot of the reviews, but. I really admired her by the end. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you really learn who she really is. Yeah, thank you. Dave? Is it just the coincidence that Amy Ray is the name of one of the Indigo Girls? Oh. <laughs> you would only know that. <laughs> Dave's very big into music. Anybody else? Is that just a coincidence? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I just have to say thank you all, because it was, when I left Henniker tonight, I mean, I couldn't see the car in front of me. It was just a downpour, and it was ice, and then it got, you know, where it was just rain, and then there were two terrible accidents. It was like two hours just to get to Manchester, and unfortunately, we were able to have dinner with Bob and Linda, and that was really nice, and I thank my husband, who's been incredibly patient and generous through all of this, and my friends out here for showing up. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, John. Uh, I was swept along by your enthusiasm. What I observed was... Uh, 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 a story that started to develop, and as you were reading it, your enthusiasm increased, and the pace of speaking and reading increased, and I was swept along with you in that uh, propulsion forward. So that was a lot of fun. Thank you. Good. You get, you get. There's other writers out here, and you do get very attached to your characters. They feel very real to you, and when you've slept where they've slept, you, you're in those moments imagining it, and it feels like it really happened. 
So I do get, I think I do get, I think that happens when you're writing too. So, how, so when, tell us about the process. When did you, I remember you saying to me, I've got a little house in the back of the house. <laughs> I'm going to go there. And, I, and you were on sabbatical? Maybe? Maybe I'm not remembering. <laughs> no, you, you're remembering but, correctly. But I knew that you, I remember that conversation. We were, it's new, and I just knew, this was after I was coming out of the other, on the other side of the grief, and I knew, you know, one, one of the things Sean had said to me was, go write your book. You know, you have to do this. Promise me you will do this. You know, I've been holding you back, and I hadn't been, you know, I'd been settling his stuff, and you know, finally I got to the point where I was able to let that go and I thought I have to do something different and I, I was in the house and I could hear the refrigerator and I'd hear the buzzing of anything and noise and stuff and I just, I literally felt like I was losing my mind and I just started loading stuff, <laughs> like taking to the transfer station, cleaning out the house, cleaning windows, washing. I didn't want stuff around me. I told Katie this story and so maybe part of it was menopause, I don't know, but I... <laughs> It was like the more chaos that was around me, the more I couldn't find the thoughts in my head to write. There had been so much noise in my head for so long that I needed peace around me. And I just simplified as much. And I still, you know, now I've remarried and I've got two stepkids, so I need to do it again. But, but it's still not bad. I mean, you know, he's on the same page as I am. We don't like a lot of clutter around us. And we just, we try to just get that out of the way. And even then, I'd sit there. But, you know, there were so many memories there, and this and that, but the memories started creating noise. Mm -hmm. And it was still real life. This was my job, and there were teaching papers over here and bills over here, and that wasn't going to work for me. And so I got the idea. I started shopping around for sheds, and I put up an 8 by 8 shed. I had a carpenter down the street come build it, and it literally is just an 8 by 8 shed outside of the house, backs up to the trees, and there's a conduit that we ran underground to the back of it where we ran two long 150 foot extension cords from the garage and they run through a little hole I drilled in there and there's a little five gallon propane heater outside and a little propane heater inside and I cracked the windows so I don't get cancer um, and I have a little air conditioner one of those little teeny air conditioners I put up in it for when it gets really hot which I really never use um, and I have a plywood desk and above the door, there's a shelf where I can put all my writing materials. And the only thing in that shed, there's no pictures, there's no memorabilia, there is nothing but what I'm working on for that novel. So when I walk into that shed, it is my story, I'm inhabiting it, I'm inhabiting my characters, I do have a candle I light. I do have a little plastic horse, because I love horses, that sits on my windowsill that Greg got me on our honeymoon and in a little dime store, and his name is Owen, and he sits on the windowsill and he's my muse. <laughs> right? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> and else. that's it. And, and, you know, I have a little chair I can sit in to think, and you know, <coughs> books that I'm working on, but that's it. And once I did that, I was able to write. But it was also coming through everything, but I was able, so I have to have that space, and I can't write anywhere else. I can't write if I'm traveling, forget it, I can't. I have to be in my 8 by 8 shut. So, and it's called Wild Spaces. I haven't put the sign up yet, but that's the name for it is Wild Spaces. So, yeah, Katie. So are you working on something else? Yeah, and it's really great because I feel like this book taught me how to do it, to do what I've always wanted to do. Um, I realize now I need the structure. And I'm not a person who just wants to sit down and write and just write wherever it takes me because I ended up for, throwing away, I told Linda, over 400 pages on this book. I never knew what it was going to be. It started years ago. But really, I wrote it in about eight months when I really knew what it was going to be. And I don't, I, I'm, you know, when I hit 50, I, I got depressed. I bawled, I cried. Now I'm 52, and I'm like, okay, this is not okay. This is not cool. We don't have time to dilly dally around and just write whatever we think we're going to write and throw out 400 pages. I got to, I got to use my time. So I do know what I'm going to write. It's a, very quickly, it's a, about a, a female conservation canine handler. And I've done all the research. I've gone on conservation projects with them in the wilderness. Um, I've researched it in Alberta, Montana, Washington State, and now we're getting ready to do their last trip. Greg's going to go with me on this one to Utah. And she falls in love for the first time in her 30s with another conservation canine handler. So there's a, there's a romance there and a love story. But after a very traumatic event, she begins to 
wonder if possibly either she's crazy or if possibly he might have been responsible for the disappearance of a number of women in the world weeks. But there, it too <coughs> has a lot of psychological play and a lot of psychological story to it. So. What's the conservation canine handler too? So conservation canine handler, this was started out of the University of Washington and it is, it is real. These are shelter dogs who are adopted and saved and they are ball crazy. They will do anything to play with the ball. So nobody wants them. Well, this group takes them. They're called, literally, they're called um, conservation canine group or something. I that's their official name. They train these dogs to, toward scent. So maybe they train them toward grizzly scent, or maybe they train them to, to lynx scent, to whatever species they're going to be studying. And the reward, when the dog finds the scat, is to get to play with the ball. Yeah. And then, okay, go find. Then they go find the next. And they have the commands. They go through all of this. And they literally back, you know, bush it through really thick woods terrain. The study I went on was an area in the Selkirk Mountains in northeastern Washington state where wolves had been introduced and they wanted to see the effect that this introduction of wolves had had on the grizzly and the black bear as well as on the deer population in the area. And so the dogs were identifying any grizzly, black bear, or deer scat. I think there were a couple other animals we were looking at. I think moose too we were looking at. Um, and then it's sent back to the labs. And when this is analyzed in the labs, they can determine the DNA, they can determine stress level hormones, they can determine all of these factors, they can even determine if the stress is from environment induced, from people, a lot of times this is used where logging is going on heavy, they want to see the effect that's happening. And these projects are going on all over the world that this group is doing. Right now, one of the girls I worked with, she's been, um, she's back in the area on a snowmobile with one of the dogs, just herself, in a snowmobile, and this dog getting up into the snow country continuing with the project. And then she was in Africa three months before that. So it's fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah Steph. Do you, will you talk a little bit about um, getting published and working with your editor at Berkeley? Yeah, it was a, I mean, it was a godsend. It's been a long journey. But I think the first thing is to just write the best book you can write. And then when people ask me that, don't worry about the publishing. Write the best book you can write because the book is dedicated to the town of Meeker, where I lived in Colorado, but it's also dedicated to Carol Hawk Smith, who is a, she was a literary legend, and she was my literary mentor. And she told me, she said, you only get an editor and agent size once. And that really stuck with me. So one reason I also waited was, I wasn't gonna send something out that wasn't worthy. I knew I had to wait till it was right. And then I met, um, I think, then getting out there and meeting people, networking, I think the MFA has been great for people meeting people. And, because at one of the conferences I met an agent and when she wanted, you know, asked me what my writing was about, my literary, literary agent had passed away that previous year and she knew this and she said, well, what are you working on? When I told her, it interested her. The story, I had that pitch. I knew what it was about at that point and I told her and she said, I want but I said, you know, my husband had passed away. I'm really just kind of paralyzed from the writing and she said, I want to I see what you've done. Just send me something with you back. I'll, I'll let you know if I like it. And she did. She called and said, I want to offer you a contract. Let's get this done. No more wasting time. Let's do it. And that was really good for me because I had someone in my court at that point. Um, but I think, yeah, write the best book you can and then find an agent who believes in you and who's not going to give up on you and will encourage you, you know, with the process. And from there, you know, we got, I worked with her. She worked like an editor. And when she sent the book out within literally a week, um, we had two houses that were wanting the book, and but the book was ready, you know. And so for, that was you know a year ago. So in one year, the book's out, and they've sent me on tour, and you know they're interested in getting this next one going, and you know things are moving along. So, but I think the biggest lesson I learned about publishing is finding that space in your life to write the book. Really, that's the hardest part. It really is. You guys have been amazing. I don't want to keep you out too late because you're going to get real tired going home. So um, I'm here to sign books if you would like, and I'm just really appreciative that you're all here. And it's really great to see like, people who I don't know who come and read the book. That's just terrific. <laughs>